It's three o'clock in the morning and here we are. Nice thing about being jet lagged is you get an early start on the day. So I was been looking at this thing all morning with the, you, for this a knee brace and it's, it's too long. It's just the scale isn't right. It just, it looks too, too um, spindly, too willowy. So I'm gonna shorten it up a little bit. So I kind of pushed it up here into a position where I, I think it looks a little bit better. It means we're gonna have to take about four inches, three or four inches or so off of each end. And I've got them marked here, but I think this, the way it looks now is pretty good. So let's, uh, let's pack up our stuff. We'll go over to the wood shop and we'll uh, cut the shoulder on this and, and plane it down and get everything ready. But uh, we should get, this, should get this in today. I'm trying to get in the habit of working out of my toolbox. That way I'm not chasing things around. All right, before we chop our mortise, we need to shorten up this knee brace and put a little shoulder on it right there. Reason for that shoulder is we gotta have an inch and a half, right? Because we're gonna use an inch and a half chisel to chop that mortise, you need an inch and a half tenon. That way, by putting a shoulder on there, we could use any random width we want, but we have some uniformity there. So I've got this end done, and then uh, let's, uh, we'll do this one here together. All right, we got the layout all done there. Standard for me here, a bunch of, uh, Seems like I, I really struggle with the math with these angles. When you don't do this all the time, it just, it bakes my noodle. So I put a squiggly line on there for, for <laughs> I'm always uh, having to decide which line it was that I wanted. So I put the squiggly line on there that, that makes, that's the one, don't cut that one is what that tells me. So these are not super critical. Now our shoulder cut here, this one's gonna be important to get that one right. We'll do that a little bit different, but just here we're gonna use our, our low budget pull saw. Oh, I can't wait to get my new Japanese saw. I checked the tracking number. It's not going to be here till Monday, but that's all right. We'll, we'll have it for the next project. All right. So let's cut this to length here. Now we can cut the other side and I, you know, I really need visual aids. I am uh, getting a little bit better at cutting handsaw, cutting with a handsaw. But boy, it is a skill that is elusive. But I'll put that on there. That way I can kind of keep an eye on what I'm cutting here and make sure I follow that line the best I can. What, what really helps when I, I know what helps me anyway is when I'm cutting is I don't want to come over here over the side of my line, right? And so I'll, put my finger on there really, and I'll line it up and really pull gently and keep my finger there. Whoops. Keep my finger there until uh, I get uh, a little bit of a curve started. And then it's, uh, then I can follow my line. Already you can see, uh, so put that line there that I getting a little bit crooked. So. I'll straighten my saw up there. That's a problem with the pole saw is you can't, uh, you always got to keep looking over to see your line. Now we got to cut our shoulder and this is, this is the important bit that this is done um, cleanly because it's going to be a part that shows where the, these cuts here will be buried in the mortise. They don't matter so much, but you know, we're gonna go. Okay, so we're gonna go use the old Paul Sellers knife fall method. Put your knife, you can, one of these little Stanley knives is, I sure do like this tool, but you can use a, uh, you can use a regular knife too. I've done both, but this has got such a nice point on it. I think I've really enjoyed, or, uh, uh, you, you, something that I kind of learned from watching Paul was he resharpens his all of his blades. You know, it didn't dawn on me. You know, when you have, sometimes you buy these things or you buy the razor knife blades and you, you know, we all just throw them away, right? But uh, when you get those diamond stones and you have a, a when you have a sharpening method that you're comfortable with, you know, sharpening knives and blades and stuff is, you know, it's so elusive. It's it's a difficult thing to do and and. If you're like me, you know, you've had so many bad experiences where you spent a lot of time trying to sharpen something and then 
to just to be dissatisfied with it when you're done. And sometimes it's, it's been my experience. It's even worse than when I started and it's kind of, you know, it's kind of frustrating and it makes you, you know, it just makes you want to kind of give up. But having those diamond stones set up in the little tray and, and getting accustomed to using them and always having them at the ready has really changed that for me because I, 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 um, I can just go over and, and just sharpen knives and I've been sharpening my, um, like my drywall blades and all that. And I, I know they're not super expensive and it's easy to replace them. And I'm, it's probably not a great option if you're a tradesman because time is money, but for projects where there has to be something satisfying and resharpening one of those blades rather than just taking it and throwing it away. It is, it is for me anyway. All right. So we made, you know, I don't know, maybe five or six passes across there. It's nice and deep. And I'll just take my, I'm using a three quarter inch chisel, but you can use a, a one inch or whatever you have. And you're just taking that in there and you can feel it kind of pop since you break through and run into that knife wall. And what this is going to really help us do is to get a nice clean edge on here. I have a tendency, my saw wants to, because of my lack of ability with it, wants to kind of jump out and then I get a kind of a mess up my end there and get a, it's always kind of unsatisfactory. Oh, I like it. this is, this is real woodworking here, right? Very satisfying. I enjoy this. I like this little bit. Yeah, just put that in there and just make sure you cut all those membranes there. And then that should just pop out of there like that. I mean, if you want to, this is, I don't think this is really necessary, but you could, if you wanted to Go along there and cut that out. Maybe just to get it a little bit deeper. A little less of a chance for it to, to jump out. But now we got a clean, got a nice clean, we'll have a clean edge for our shoulder there. And it really helps me anyway. It helps with the, the sawing now because I can, uh, I can, you know, lay that in there like this here. You know, carpenter's pencil is not ideal for timber framing. You know, I mean, if we're doing some really fine woodworking or cabinet making, or you know, we'd want want a finer pencil. But if you take your knife, you can put a really nice edge on these or a point on these that, for a project like this, is. Uh, oops! I just had a nice one on there, didn't I? That's pretty good right there. It's a pretty good pretty usable point. All right, so remember now we want that, we're gonna be cut, cutting an inch and a half mortise. So we wanna, I've got an inch and a half here on my combination square. Now I use my knife there to put a mark because it's, you know, that pencil, it's fat. And so if I measure this out an inch and a half and I put my pencil on there, it's gonna be a little bit too big. You can see there's like a 30 second too big. So I'll make a little knife mark and then adjust my combo square accordingly so that when I'm making my mark, I'm right there on that pencil line. So we'll, we can go along here. Whoops. And this is going to be, we're going to need this because we've got to pare all this down to that inch and a half. I'm going to want to mark all, all three sides. This is going to be a mark that we really, really need. This needs to be done right. And then the last one here. It's not a very good mark there, is it? Okay, so we've got to pare all this down to, uh, to our mark. So what uh, it seems to, what's worked pretty good for me is we're going to make a couple cuts here. Now, okay, be careful, take your time, make sure that we, uh, we cut, we're going to cut down to our mark, not beyond. That's where this line is so important. One more. Okay, I'm gonna come back here and do one more. I don't know about what type of wood you're using, but with Doug fir, that's prim primarily what I use. It has a, if you try to get too greedy by taking too big a chunks off, it, it really, it, it, it tears out and, and gets all, uh, doesn't, it's not very nice. So if I make a few more cuts like this, it seems to work pretty good. Okay, now 
we're going to make, now we, this is where the knife wall comes in. Now this is our critical cut. So we want to, these here, these are just rough cuts. We can just, you know, really get after it. But this one here is this one needs to be pretty nice. So we're going to take our time again, put my finger on the other side and hold it. And we're going to go right along that knife wall. This is a very coarse saw. This is not a, this is not a very good saw for this here, but that's what we got. I mean, it's not a bad saw. I mean, it's, I, it's, you know, these are not very expensive. They have these most, I think maybe Home Depot's even carrying these um, for the money. I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good saw. I mean, I've, I've had a, used it a long time. Jack even left it out in the rain and it didn't do it any good, but it's still working. Okay, now we're, uh, we can go ahead and knock this material off. Once we get that pared down with our small chisel, boy, this is where the timber framing slick comes in handy. You can really see all those. It's only going to pick up the high spots. It's going to help you get some uniformity. Boy, happiness is a sharp chisel. So for the last bit, we're going to pair right down to that line. And what I typically do is I'll come out here to the edge and put my hand on this and, and roll that around. I'm hitting my workbench and roll it around and I can really control it and I'm pairing off, pairing right down to that line. Isn't that nice? Take the field out, keep rolling around like that. Watch your grain, you know, if you start getting tear out, just move and come from the different direction. But I think we're pretty good. So I'll just go across that one more time. And I think that looks really good. So we can just, again, take and cut those last remaining fibers loose. I want a nice sharp, nice sharp edge there. Don't want anything holding us out. So one thing you might want to do or remember to do on your chisels is, uh, is to coat, coat them with oil when you're done using them. Even if you, you, think, you might think that just because it's wet or it's not wet or you didn't get water on it that it's not going to rust. But, you know, it depends on your body chemistry as well. You know, if you really have uh, a lot of salt in your sweats, there's just some people that are more corrosive, maybe more caustic than others. And I, for example, when I have my hand or my thumbs on these chisels, uh, if I leave them without coating them, the next day it'll be pitted with rust. And so make sure you, you get that off there. And as I've shown in past videos, the uh, ballast doll in, on a rag, this is like a, a really nice kind of a chamois I just keep in here. And the reason why I keep it in that box is I can, if I can take the ballast doll and I can just uh, pour it in there a little bit on the rag. And it lasts a long time. I only have to do that about once every three months or so. And the, your can of ballastol will last for years, where if you try to drip it on the tool, there's a, just a lots and lots of waste. So I'll take that in there. I just keep it in the tin and, and just uh, wring it out like this. Make sure it's coated and just leave it in there. That way I can very careful, very easily and quickly coat all my tools. So I'll just take it like this, make sure I 
rub and cover everything. Don't touch them again. And if you do this before you put your tools away, then you'll, uh, you'll really cut down on rust problems. All right, I think we're ready to head back to the big shop. I really like this toolbox, you know, I mean, once you start, once you start using it, this is, a, I, look, I looked around a lot when I was building this toolbox and I noticed that, a, that I mean, it's a very old design. It's uh, been used by, I think, timber framers, carpenters for a long time, and it just, it works so well. I didn't realize how much thought it went into it, whoever the original designer was, because it, you have, your timber framing tools are pretty big and you've got squares and long saws and chisels and slicks, and everything just fits in there just perfectly. It seems like it just is just, tailor-made I guess I guess it is all right let's head on over fifth joint so I'm going to try it here this will be the divider. Oh, that's nice. That is really nice. And that'll glue in there. That'll give it a lot of strength. We'll glue it to the bottom.